Let's say that this bag is for sale and you really need a new bag, especially the ladies. So before you buy this bag, you go through this certain thought process. You look at the quality of the bag, that it's made from good leather and its brand, your utility, basically the over, overall aesthetics of this bag, and of course the price. And then you make your decision whether to buy it or not. As consumers, we are limited by the aesthetics of the product. We don't consider what goes on behind the scenes. When you were thinking about buying this bag, did you ever think what, how was this bag manufactured? Or what sort of impacts does its manufacture, ma manufacturing has on the environment? No, you didn't. I believe now is the high time to focus on these important factors if we want a sustainable future for our coming generations. Let's take New Zealand's industry for an example. We're known for various industries like dairy, tannery, meat, and many more. And we're proud to produce some top quality products. But we are unaware of the fact that the processes that are conducted in these industries lead to the formation of large amounts of wastewater, which then needs to be treated before disposal. And that is an expensive process. This industrial wastewater is rich in organic content, like ammonia, nitrogen, and phosphorus which can lead to the formation of toxic compounds if disposed untreated. So to deal with this issue, usually industries redirect their wastewater streams to a separate wastewater treatment facility, where techniques like nitrification and denitrification, ammonia stripping, and iron exchange are used to convert these components into less harmful form and then dispose them off into a landfill. I must admit that our wastewater treatment facilities do a good job in treating our water and maintaining our clean and green image, also keeping our environmental councils happy. But they suffer from a huge problem of struvite formation, where crystallization occurs in pipes and machineries as seen in the images, causing high maintenance costs and sometimes plant shut down. In order to remove struvite, large amounts of acid is required, which dissolves it and then gets rid of it, which is also an extra expense on the company's behalf. As an engineer, I'm compelled by nature to look for more efficient, cost-effective, and eco-friendly solutions. And for me, struvite is not a problem, but it's a solution to some even bigger issues like global warming, depletion of a non-renewable resource, and water pollution. I see some confused faces, so let me clarify my point. Stuvite precipitation is a newly developed technique that facilitates the removal of ammonia and phosphorus from wastewater by converting these components into struvite crystal. Struvite, or magnesium ammonium phosphate hexahydrate, in short, MAP, is a white crystalline or thombic-shaped crystal which consists of equimolar concentrations of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate. Struvite has been gaining a lot of attention from industries all around the world, especially the fertilizer industry, and this is due to its unique composition that, it, that allows it to be an effective alternative source for phosphate rock. Which is, an, which is a non-renewable resource and is extensively being used in the production of phosphate-based fertilizers. Currently, countries like Germany, UK, and even Australia have started to explore the properties of struvite. Japan being, you know, step ahead, pr commercially producing it. New Zealand still thinks of struvite as an issue and is still yet to adopt this great technique. But I say, why should we be the last ones? In order to make this idea a bit more concrete, I would like to discuss with you a part of my personal research. Should I stop? Currently, I'm, exper experimenting, I'm experimenting with high ammonia wastewater and converting it into struvite. One of the objectives of my research is to make our industry aware of this new technique and its eco-friendly and profitable um, properties. The mechanism of struvite precipitation is fairly simple. 
when a magnesium and an ammonia source is added to the, um, sorry, magnesium and a phosphorus source that's added to a high ammonia wastewater, tiny crystal embryos form. This is due to an interaction between ammonia, magnesium, and phosphate ions. Over time, these crystals coagulate, forming struvite. The image here shows the following process. As crystallization occurs, the water gets clear and a precipitate forms at the bottom of the beaker. And when it's dried, it looks something like this. You can pass it along if you want to see. And that's struvite in its non-purified form. Struvite precipitation can be applied to a range of wastewater, from landfill leachate to sewage wastewater. But most importantly, any industry that conducts some sort of biological processing which most industries in New Zealand do, this technique can benefit them environmentally, economically, and socially. Being a Kiwi, we are all about keeping our environment clean and green. But are we doing enough? Each year in New Zealand, a large number of phosphate-based fertilizers are applied to the soil to enhance its fertility, but on the expense of polluting our environment. The runoffs from the rivers, or runoffs from farmlands into the rivers, causes eutrophication, which is a dense growth of plants on the river, causing, affecting the aquatic life and also causing water pollution. It's true that nitrogen and phosphorus are important plant nutrients, but they're also a burning environmental issue of present world. And this is due to their overuse in phosphate and nitrogen-based fertilizers. The issue with current fertilizers is that they're released rapidly in the soil, which lowers their efficiency and retention time in the soil, which means large applications are required. For instance, urea, which is a nitrogen-based fertilizer, releases nitrogen rapidly in the soil from which only 40% is actually recovered by the plant and 60% is lost to the atmosphere. That is then converted into nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas leading to global warming. As a fertilizer, struvite possesses various beneficial properties, therefore making it an attractive alternative for phosphate and nitrogen-based fertilizers. Some studies have shown that struvite has a low solubility in water, which makes it a perfect slow-release fertilizer with high application rates. This doesn't damage the plant's roots, and it also provides a longer resistant period in the soil. In order to assess the profitability of this new technique, I decided to create a small facility, which is an approximate representation of an actual struvite plant, that it could be an actual struvite plant. And then, doing an economical analysis around this plant, I found that the total investment into this new system would be around $9.7 million, with a payback time of 8.6 years. It's true that this plant doesn't accommodate for all the factors in a processing, industry, in, in a processing plant, but it gives us a general idea of the feasibility of this new technique, that if it is applied in our industry, it can be profitable. The production of struvite has also been, <clears throat> has also known to reduce costs, um, chemical costs in wastewater treatment as it reduces this, as it reduces the volume, as it reduces sludge volume generation by 49%. This means less landfill area is required for sludge disposal. The Social aspects of this technique might not be as evident, but it plays a major role in preserving a non-renewable resource, which is phosphate rock. Due to an increase in the world's population, it's true that the demand of food has also increased, which has put pressure on our agriculture sector to produce crops at a faster rate. The present annual consumption of phosphate rock is over 1 million tons per year which is expected to increase in future to around 70 million by, two, million by 2000, 2050. This means that at this rate of consumption, half of our economically viable phosphorus reserves can be depleted in the next 60 to 70 years. Phosphate is an essential component in living cells. 
Our DNA is made of it, and there is no substitute of phosphate in agriculture sector. Therefore, preserving this non-renewable resource is essential for our global food security. By adapting this new technique of struvite precipitation, we as a nation can contribute in preserving this non-renewable res resource and also reducing our carbon footprint on our environment. This idea is like hitting two, killing two birds with one stone. We are treating our wastewater and producing a valuable product that contributes in preserving a non-renewable resource. I think now it's time for New Zealand to take an action and convert their waste to value. Thank you. Well recovered, Shalini. Um, you still need phosphate to add to the struvite, right? Yes. Where does that come from? So. We would need phosphate only if, okay, so the wastewater that, that's, con, that's generated from our industry is already rich in phosphorus. So the experiment that I'm doing is actually to convert ammonia wastewater into struvite. For that, I need phosphate source. But if you already have a wastewater, wastewater that rich, that's rich in phosphate and ammonia, you only need magnesium chloride, which, is, which causes the crystallization to make struvite. All right, so you're relying on an abundant source of wastewater, essentially. Yes, exactly, right. yeah. And the struvite that is created naturally and lines the pipes, that's exactly what you're suggesting we put on the land as a fertilizer? Yes. Right, with, yes. with no, nothing needs to be added to that? Nothing, no. All because right. um, in wastewater treatment facilities, sometimes the pipes come in contact and the water can come in contact. So any water with you know, high ammonia content of phosphorus or magnesium, they can come in contact, and that's where the crystallization actually occurs, which causes the blockages in the pipe. So I mean, we can actually just scrape off the struvite from the, you know, the pipes or machinery and just put it on the land or convert it into a granular form, which is more durable, and then just fertilize our land. Which would be cheaper than a $9 million Plant. factory, right? Yes. But nevertheless, but then, less then you have labor costs to actually remove the struvite, which is more extensive, and then probably you have to shut down the plant, which doesn't really help the industry that is producing struvite. Do you know the chemical difference then between the struvite and the phosphate that we're putting on the land at the moment? The chemical difference is the phosphate that we are putting is just it's phosphorus. It's just phosphate. So I'll tell you how a phosphate-based fertilizer is made. So basically, phosphate, rock phosphate, which is rich in phosphorus, which is the element, um, it also has other heavy metals in it. Um, basically, they, do, they either electri electrically um, furnace it and create phosphoric acid, which is the superphosphate um, fertilizer, that's what we call it, and that's what's put on the land. Whereas with struvite, you're actually getting ammonia into the land as well, not just phosphorus. And ammonia and phosphorus are both required for the fertility of the soil. Did you say Japan is using struvite? Yes, they're commercially producing it. They're are the they still using phosphates? Phosphate Fertilizer? Rock? Yep. No, they're not. They're not so at all. So the company that actually produces it, produces it, they're selling it in the market as a you know, phosphate fertilizer, um, struvite. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.